Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon, and this is the Breaking Free Show, and I hope you're all doing well. Happy New Year. I've been off for a while, but I've been thinking about you, so I hope you're all doing well. Glad you're here, and I want to say hi to Amnon before we all get started. Hello, Marilyn. How are you? I know you miss me. <laughs> I met, boy, did I miss you. It's been two weeks, you know, and I heard the music, and I'm like, wow, that I like that music. Things never change. Not, it feels like you it were away like for a year. It does. You it's are. It's only been two weeks. It's, I know, I know, I know. Whoops. I know. You got me there. Yep. You got me there. So you're doing all right? Doing just fine. Everything good? Yep. Good, good, good. Well, it's good to be back. It's good to be back with you all as well. And let me remind you, for those of you who may not know, you are welcome to call in any time you want to this show. This show is here for you. Our phone number is 919-518-9773. And you can join us in our chat. Just put your name, nickname, whatever you like underneath the video. And you can comment, ask questions. We'll, we'll know you're there. And you can also come in on Skype vo uh, voice, not video. So don't worry. You just come in on Skype computers, and that's plural, then the number 2K voice. And please feel free. This is an open invitation for you to come in anytime you want because we want you here. And we want you to ask your questions. We want you to comment. We want you to engage. And if you don't want to, that's fine, too. Just sit back, listen, and just enjoy the show because it's going to be really interesting. So just remember, you are always welcome. So let me introduce my guest to you today, Michael Warner. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. Good. Thank you for having me. Good. It's a pleasure. I feel like I already know you. <laughs> okay. You want me to tell you a little about myself? I do. I Go do? right and, ahead. Uh, okay. So I'm very shy, as you can tell. So, uh, so basically, I am a urologist, um, went to Harvard, then UCSF, then did a fellowship. Um, so basically, didn't finish my training until I was 34, which is a little ridiculous. Uh, but I only do male and female sexual dysfunction and uh, male infertility. So my whole practice is devoted to that. And I sort of have a comprehensive slash holistic view. Um, Basically, we have a whole team that sees everyone, uh, including nurse practitioners, uh, a sex therapist, a nutritionist, um, and we really try to look at the whole person as we're doing this, but still using uh, both a medical and a psychological model. Uh, so it's really the best job in the world. I've been doing it for 25 years, and uh, it's just super fun. So tell me, tell us, what is your overall philosophy? about male dysfunctional, about sexual male dysfunction and all of that. What's your overall philosophy? Got it. So there's a bunch of pieces to that. The first thing is that, I mean, if you think about it, sex is a little bit weird. Like, why is it so important that people have sex? But it is the foundation um, for an intimate relationship, you know, for a partnership. Um, again, I'm going to usually use... Um, uh, you know, male, female, but um, my whole family is gay. I have what we say in Yiddish is gay yechis, because basically, you know, we have trans, we have gay, we have lesbians. So, um, and my son is a well-known gay activist. Um, but um, it's really, really important for an intimate relationship that people have sexual intimacy. It doesn't have to be intercourse, but they have to be doing things that they wouldn't do with their brother or sister, you know? And I've watched this for years and years and years. And if people don't maintain that intimacy, then the relationship kind of implodes or explodes. So I think it's really, really important that, um, you know, that this happened. And the second thing is that I really want to normalize the dysfunction. It's just, it's very, very, very common. I uh, will talk about men, though we have a women's center for men to have erection issues. As we get older, we all lose our testosterone. As we get even older, it can become harder and harder to ejaculate. Um, it's estimated that 30% of men have premature ejaculation, which most of them think is their fault. Uh, it's actually just the way they're built. And all of these uh, issues can be and should be managed. Um, so it's a very gratifying field. But the bottom line is, like, if we talk about erections, you know, my mantra is, if you have a penis, we can get you an erection. Like, we, <laughs> this is one of those fields where we really, we can get you, you know. Um, many of my patients have seen people who are not specialists, and then it takes them a lot of courage to, you know, to go to the doctor, you know, you have erection issues, you think, oh my God, this is disastrous. It's so embarrassing. I've had people throwing up in my parking lot, you know, they're just so anxious, you know, and then they've gone to other people and then not gotten, you know, a good um, result or spent a lot of, 
no one spent a lot of time with them and figured it out. And then, you know, they're very discouraged and they leave it for another five years. And I find that very sort of depressing, but we really, really can make a difference, you know, in, in all cases. So it's so, very gratifying. Well, before I, I do have lots of questions, but the first piece okay. I just want to say is to everyone listening, and I know our audience can be from, you know, the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world. Just know that, you know, Michael can see you, talk to you from anywhere in the world, and he does. So just keep that in mind. His, his um, what do you call it, a clinic? Do you call yeah, it a I guess a clinic? It's, a clinic always feels like it's sort of like, you know, a lot of people waiting in, in plastic chairs. But, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't really know what to call it. But, yeah, okay. our center. Your center. Um, yeah, we have people who fly in from all over the world. And, and I like to feel like once we, once someone sees us, they never want to not see us. So, you know, once we've been seeing people, uh, they, they do come across uh, the, the country pretty frequently. And that's an important fact. So tune in, keep, you know, keep listening because you're going to want to hear the rest. So first of all, what prompted you to focus in this area? What is it about this? Yes. Yes. I've always, um, I don't really know exactly why, but I've always been obsessed um, with, uh, you know, sexual function and uh, infertility. I actually went to medical school knowing that I was going to do this. I couldn't really decide whether I was going to be a psychiatrist or an OBGYN or a urologist. And I sort of like the hands-on. So sort of, uh, I do a lot of psychiatry, but I like to be able to do uh, more hands-on stuff. So it's turned out to be heavenly. It was just a very long road for this particular topic, but I am obsessed. I mean, my family makes fun of me all the time because if I get into a cab, you know, I know exactly how many children they have. Uh, I'm always a baby pusher. I want people to have more kids when it's appropriate. Um, I do what's called a no needle, no scalpel vasectomy, which is a very uh, uh, sophisticated way of doing a a vasectomy that can be done in the office with really minimal pain, discomfort, uh, sort of the standard of care. I actually uh, have traveled internationally doing that. So I want people to have what they want with their families. And and so I'm sort of obsessed with that. So it was really a natural outgrowth of my personality and interests um, sort of in an unusual way. No, Well, I, you know, it's interesting for everyone listening, because one of the first things you you were asking, you know, about our families and you know, about our children, grandchildren, all of that. And, and, you know, I thought, well, that's interesting. And so you, you just, you, you just, what is it all about love? Is it about, what is it about connection for you? What's it about? I would say love and and family. You know, I'm just, um, I come from a family where like a lot of children uh, were lost. And so there was always a feeling that you wanted to have more children around than there were. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why I started our, we have a cord blood bank, which actually is a service that people can use uh, nationally, almost an internationally. That's where you take the blood from the placenta after the baby is born. Um, you process it. It can be frozen. Um, and then God forbid they get, you know, a blood disorder, then it can be, you know, given back um, and can be life-saving. And so uh, there's a lot of cord blood banks. We're just one of the best and uh, and the cheapest. So I really want to make it accessible financially. But I think that sort of permeated sort of who I am. Wow. Um, it's amazing, really. I got the chills. Yeah. It, yeah, I yeah, got the chills. Yeah, it's sort of fun to do exactly what you're passionate about. Sure. You know? um, so I never want to retire. Like uh, my, my wife uh, and I get along very well. It's been 34 years. But... Um, her mantra is forever, but not for lunch, you know, so uh, <laughs> uh, because I get what are called spilkas. Like if I'm not working or doing something productive, I am not a happy camper. I hear you. Uh, and I really do love going to work. I hear you. So tell me, is there a theme that you're noticing for, um, for, for, the, for the dysfunction or what? Is there some kind of a theme you're noticing for the time? Is, it, is there a medical theme? Is there an emotional theme? What are you seeing? So yes, yes, and yes. So um, I think what's one of the most important themes for, let's, we'll talk about the men. That's going to be the basis of today's discussion. Right. We do have a center where we see women with sexual dysfunction. And, and hold on a second. Uh, we did do a, um, a show on women's dysfunction, and you will find that replay on our YouTube channel. And it was very interesting. And if anybody has any questions about it, just reach out to me and I will guide you. And then um, uh, Batsheva, who works with uh, Michael, was on our show and talking about women's um, 
you know, sexual health and well-being. So we have that for you as well. Just know that. But today we want to focus on the men. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah so actually I'll, I'll take a little segue because it's just coincidentally. This morning I did do some of the procedures for what's called vaginismus. We are actually probably one of the world centers for vaginismus. And that we do have people fly all over uh, the world. In fact, today we had someone from South Carolina, you'll be pleased, and we had someone from Florida and someone from uh, Indianapolis come in. And vaginismus is where uh, a woman clenches in, involuntarily the, the muscles of the vagina so tightly that nothing can come in. So um, they can't put a tampon in, they can't have intercourse, obviously, they can't have a OBGYN exam. And it used to be sort of incurable. And um, actually a Holocaust survivor uh, came up with the, the idea and then sort of turned it over to us. And we bring them in, we put them under anesthesia, they're tight even under anesthesia. It's really remarkable. And then we dilate them up gently and we actually paralyze the muscles temporarily of the, vag of the vaginal wall with Botox. And then we teach them how to uh, put a dilator in and out. And by that time they're, the Botox is worn off, the vast majority of them are able to have intercourse. So it's really a game changer. We had a woman come in from... Um, actually uh, from Vietnam, and she actually had a child, and the way she actually conceived was they had dripped the sperm uh, on the outside, and it gotten in, and she got pregnant, and even after she delivered, though, she couldn't have sex, and so she was, and was successful. She started having sex at 45, even though she had a, you know, a daughter in her 20s, so it was pretty amazing. So that's the vaginismus, uh, but going back to the men, mm -hmm. um, the, the, I think one of the overarching important ideas to that people have to understand is that um, sexual dysfunction or just having problems, we'll just do the simplest one, erection issues, is a natural part of aging. You know, If you live long enough, you will almost invariably have erection issues. Um, I have four boys, that's where uh, the name Maze comes from, uh, Matthew, Adam, Zach, and Evan. And, uh, and when I teach their high school classes, I always take the seniors and talk to them about sex and I look them in the eye and I say, all of you in this room, at some point, as inconceivable uh, as it is to you now, will have problems at some point with erections. Um, and just know that that's just like uh, a normal part of aging, just like you're going to need reading glasses at some point. And don't get all you know shocked about it. Don't get so upset about it. Don't deny it. Just manage it, because we can always manage it. And that's the nice thing about this field. Um, and then, of course, it is a combination many times of a physical and a psychological issue. But I think people are very quick to, especially with younger patients, to say, well, you know, you're, you're only 30, so this is probably mostly psychological. So go see a therapist and um, that'll cure it. So we will always do an evaluation um, because a certain percentage of these men will have a primary physical problem. We will always have them see our sex counselor and advisor to sort of get a background history. And, um, but we will usually sort of attack it in both ways. And often, you know, if it becomes its own loop, so you're not getting a good erection, then you get really anxious. Then of course, the next time you fail. So sometimes even when we figure out that it is, um, anxiety. Um, we'll try to treat the anxiety, but we'll also make sure that they get an erection. We'll sort of blast through it. Uh, and then um, often it'll just disappear, which is lovely. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very gratifying. It is. So what, what do you notice what happens with a man once they are, you know, healed? What happens to their personality, to their, just how they feel about things? What do you notice? Right. right. So we are, Men are obsessed with their penises and they're obsessed with their ability to, to have intercourse, the vast majority. And so it does an amazing number in a bad way uh, on a men's self-esteem and on their uh, interactions with their partners. We find a really bad dynamic happens. Uh, you know, men start having problems with erections. So let's say they're married to a woman and then what they do is they start becoming less affectionate because they're afraid if they give their wife a hug, then that's gonna to lead to something. And so they're pulling away. 
and women in my mind are much nicer than men and and women will often then take it on themselves and they'll say like oh my god he's not finding me attractive anymore maybe he's having an affair um and so then they're feeling badly about themselves and the way their partners are feeling about them and it becomes this terrible cycle um and so we really and it really just tears a relationship apart so we find that we really need to get them back into intimacy um i'm always tell the guys who put off coming for about 10 years that we're going to get you great erections your wife is going to be thrilled and then she's going to be really angry at you for being such a goofball for putting this off for 10 years cuz you put both of you through hell for really no reason and we see that all the time it's like they're grateful and they're like what the hell were you thinking you know right. so because women interact with the medical system much more intelligently and frequently than men Um, I was approached actually by the county of Westchester, which is where I live, uh, north of New York, and um, they were saying that the the best way to get men into the health system is through sexual function. You know, they can be having heart attacks or strokes or things like that. They're much less interested in treating that than they are their erection issues. Interesting, but you know, it's it's great. Your personality is great because you make this seem like, on some level, no big deal, and people need to feel it, it, that. Right. Right. It's really it's just like if you go to the I mean I always use the reading glasses if you go to the ophthalmologist or optometrist cuz you can't read a book anymore then no one's going to look askance and that's the way we sort of look at this uh mm-hmm. young or old this is going to happen to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um one of the most common things we see is premature ejaculation. You know, we think that 30% of men have premature ejaculation. Um and which is can be defined differently but basically you know the formal definition is if a man penetrates uh, into vagina it can be an anus um and ejaculates within less than a minute then that's premature ejaculation i think that's a little strict to me if if a man spending the whole time once he penetrates saying please don't come please don't come please don't come then you know obviously that's taking a lot of the fun out of it and that's something we can always manage mm-hmm. and a lot of people feel very guilty about it and badly about themselves and wonder <clears throat> was it the way i learned how to masturbate is it unresolved feelings about my mother is it it's really just the way some people are built just like some people have faster reflexes and slower reflexes and so we just have to slow them down and so you help i mean it's kind of like you're teaching them how to have sex yeah in this case what we do is we need to uh, uh, since it's medical sometimes we have to put them on medications we have to put them on numbing agents i mean there's we can get them erections that can last through the ejaculation so there's d- many different ways of treating this um but we it definitely needs to be managed because you know if there's this whole build up and then you're inside for 30 seconds especially if you I uh, have a, a a partner who reaches an orgasm through intercourse then it's very frustrating for both of you. Mm-hmm. So that's something we can always manage. It takes patience but we can always do it. So what has um, been a case that and I, and this could be private. I don't know if you if you talk about it specifically, you know, that might be um something you can't do, but can you give us some ideas of some of the types of cases you see? Well our favorite cases are the guys who come in and really their life <laughs> sounds terrible we their lives are a mess you know and they come in um and they're not engaging in they're not they're afraid to start a relationship because they're not getting good erections uh one of the main reasons that they started not getting good erections is anxiety or social anxiety um they may have a very low testosterone so their libido and their interest is low they may have ADHD ADHD on top of all this so for uh-huh. us when they come in uh and especially if they're a lovely person we were, we look at them and we're like oh this is a fun project because we are going to like totally turn around this guy's life um the, at their first appointment they've they filled out a bunch of questionnaires i think you know i mentioned it. we'll look at their nutrition we'll look at their sleep patterns with their anxiety and depression we'll look at their erections uh we'll look at their nutrition they'll they'll meet with our nurse practitioner then they'll meet with me we'll sort of come up with a game plan they meet with our sex advisor and our sex counselor they meet with our nutritionist uh we do our evaluation we sort of figure out what's going on we and then we try to treat all of these different pieces um and so it's really it's a game changer for a lot of these men and that's very very gratifying and you feel sort of like you've gotten them on the right track and i don't mean to be you know conceited but i don't feel that 
almost anywhere that I've ever seen marshals all of these resources with really, really good people um, to sort of address all of the problems that come up. I bet uh, so, they come in looking kind of ragged, and then once they've come through <laughs> some of this stuff, they become they begin to look dapper, you know, and they start feeling um, better about themselves. Yeah, well, if I could make people look dapper, I would have done that to myself <laughs> too. But so, tell me uh, something about is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell me something about nutrition. I, so uh, the the key with nutrition is um, think about getting an erection. In order to get an erection, a man has to get the blood into his penis and he has to hold onto it. Um, and think about the blood inflow. Um, it's just like you have to get good blood flow into your heart so that you don't have a heart attack or a stroke. So anything that is going to make you more likely to have a cardiovascular event, like a heart attack or a stroke, is going to be more likely to give you erection issues. So the classic ones are smoking, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, you know, high cholesterol, inactivity, not exercising enough. So all of these things will make you more likely to have erection issues. Um, and in fact, there's data that shows that if you develop uh, erection issues in your 40s, you are 50, five zero times more likely to have a major heart attack or stroke than someone else your age in the next five years, because it's like a harbinger. It's like the first sign of some vascular problems. So it's really very motivating for people uh, when they see that they're getting erection issues to start taking better care of themselves. So I have very, I'm a great believer in the cholesterol medicines, the statins. Um, and many of my patients have come in having been told by their doctors to go on a statin and they're like, I don't like being on a pill and it makes me feel old. And then I say, that's fine. But that's why you have the erection issues. And if you don't take good care of yourself, you're going to have a heart attack or stroke in five years. And they're, they're much more willing to listen to what we have to say. Absolutely. And that having sex makes you feel young. It does. It does. Yes. It's it good makes you feel, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So, and then, so, um, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, one of the other uh, main things that we treat are men with uh, low testosterone levels. Um, and so it's amazing how much we are dependent on our hormones in terms of our, our functioning. So a low testosterone can, men, can make men have a low libido. They can, it can affect their erections, but only modestly. Uh, it can affect their, it can give them difficulty getting, uh, you know, putting on muscle and taking off fat and even getting themselves to exercise. Um, and it can absolutely decrease their energy levels. Um, and so when men come in and they have symptoms and a low testosterone, we're very actually aggressive about putting men on testosterone. Uh, it's really important to remember that if you take testosterone from the outside, it will shut down at least temporarily sperm production. So it's important that men who still want to have sperm either use different medications than testosterone or bank their sperm. We do have a, a sperm bank. Um, but um, I, I think the men, 90% of the men who have symptoms and a low testosterone, when we treat them aggressively, will notice dramatic improvements uh, in the way they feel. And again, if the normal is like 300, we're not aiming for 400 or 450, we're aiming for 700, 800, 900. Um, and then over the course of the year, they will feel dramatically better. Interesting. Um, yeah, there's a lot of fear about testosterone. People are worried that it's going to increase prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. That's That was in the books a long, long time ago. But I can tell you that they've completely disproven that theory. And in fact, if a man comes in and he has diagnosed prostate cancer, and my office, of course, is in New York City and then in Westchester County. Um, uh, so I work a lot with Sloan Kettering. And they can have diagnosed prostate cancer and be on a surveillance protocol where they're watching them mm -hmm. and they're completely comfortable with us putting them on testosterone. Mm -hmm. So it clearly does not exacerbate or create uh, prostate cancer. And the second thing is men are worried that it's going to cause heart attacks or strokes. Uh, but there was the best paper out there came out. It was a Kaiser paper looking at 22,000 men with low testosterone, and they put 8,000 of them on testosterone, and they followed them for three years for all cardiovascular events. Um, and guess what? Guess what they found? What? It actually decreased the heart attacks and strokes by a full third. And the reason is, I don't think the testosterone itself is having effect on the blood vessels, but if the men are on testosterone, they have more energy, 
they exercise more. As you alluded to, they're happier. They feel more vibrant. Uh, they just change physically and psychologically, and that has a huge effect on them. Right. So I think testosterone is really underused um, for a lot of men who could benefit from it. Well, it, it, it appears to me, and I'm not a doctor and I'm far from a doctor, but it appears to me that you're learning, I mean, they're, you're an innovator, and you've got to be learning just from the people who are coming in and from your own practice because there's not that much out there that you can connect things to like you are, like you have to be. Right. I would say that um, I am an early adopter of mm -hmm. things when they're good. My father was a physician and he always said, you know, don't be the first to, to use a medication or treatment, but don't be the last. Mm -hmm. Like once something's new, you know, don't jump on everything because a lot of things turn out to be, you know, flashes in the pan and even dangerous, but, mm -hmm. you know, don't be a stick in the mud. And if it's good, then, then use it. Mm -hmm. So I would say, I would say where I am most innovative, most of the time, there's other things that we've done is by just sort of the, uh, the way we've set things up so that patients get a huge amount of time and a bunch of different, uh, people looking at them in different ways so that we get a comprehensive picture of what's going on. And then we will meet as a team, you know, and discuss, you know, how we best want to work with this patient. And I think that's where I've been more innovative. Right. I will say that there's two things that I'm very proud of that we actually have been very innovative in. So one is with male infertility. So there's a, about 15% of couples will have problems with fertility and about, um, uh, fifty percent of them will be from a male factor, um, and then about fifteen percent of those men will have actually no sperm in the ejaculate. Um, and one of the things uh, we, the way we approach that, it's pretty uh, interesting. But once you've maximized their sperm production and figured out what's going on, we brought in there was a technique uh, originated in Israel where you actually take this. Some of those men will actually have very, very, very low levels of sperm production, but you wouldn't see it in a, you know, a typical uh, semen analysis. So we can actually spin it down. We spend five or six hours looking at it underneath the microscope um, and isolating individual sperm and freezing them on a special uh, like tray that the Israelis created. And each one of those sperm can then be injected into an individual egg um, with, uh, with ICSI and, and, you know, and babies can come with, for men who really look like they're not going to have any sperm. So those, we have people starting to fly in from all over the country. We call it the extended sperm search and microfreeze. You yeah. know? So that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah it is really cool. So that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, the other thing that's really interesting now, which I did not uh, create is there's something called, we've never been able to sort of cure, um, sec erectile dysfunction. Um, but there's something called low intensity shock wave, which is really like a pressure wave that we can use on the penis. Uh, most people have heard of like, we use a shock wave to break up kidney stones. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like this, you know, it's a, you go into a bath and it's a very intense shock and it isolates, it goes right onto the stone uh, and breaks it up. So that's high intensity shockwave. And there's something called low intensity shockwave therapy, where we can actually uh, put it on the penis. And we know that that brings blood flow uh, into the penis. And it's not been FDA approved, though it's used throughout the world. It's been approved in China and India and Israel and Europe, and they are going for approval here. And it can actually, at least long term, if not permanently, improve the blood flow. So we've gotten some men off any uh, interventions by using that. But how long so does something pretty... like that take to be approved here? Uh, you know, you can do it without <laughs> approval. The, the nice thing about your MD degree is you can sort of do almost anything you want on any patient. You just have to make sure you're doing the right thing, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, it'll catch up right, with you. Uh, so, yeah. so I... Yeah, so I do have the machine and I'm doing it. Um, it could be a while till it's FDA approved. Right. And just because it's FDA approved doesn't mean that insurance companies are going to pay for it. So those are two right. different steps. Exactly. But we've made it you know, very reasonable because it's really quite exactly. easy to do, actually. Now, you also yeah. mentioned sleep. And sleep's a big issue for a lot of people. So how does that enter into the picture? So um, it is a big deal for a lot of people. And I would have to say of all the things that we do, I find it... I like to be able to help everyone on everything and sleeping is still this big 
sort of closed unknown. And it's, I mean, there's obviously sleep physicians who are really spend their lives with that. And we have patients who just cannot get a good night of sleep, but we will often, we're often at the very beginning of this. And so a lot of men will come in with what's called sleep apnea, which right. means that they are not breathing correct. You know, uh, they, they stop breathing for long periods of time and they're not getting enough oxygen when they are breathing. And we know that that can affect erection issues as well as, of course, you know, daytime fatigue and, and have a lot of overlap with the symptoms of low testosterone. So we actually uh, screen them for sleep apnea. That's one of the questions. I'm glad you brought it up. The questionnaires that they fill out at the very beginning. And we actually have some portable machines that they can take home so they don't have to go to a sleep lab that will screen for the sleep apnea. If we do find that they have sleep apnea, First of all, if they often if they lose weight through going on the testosterone uh, and exercise more, um, that that will disappear. Sometimes it's weight it's weight and age related usually, and and uh, and if not, then there's machines that they can wear uh, at night, and it's it can be really game changing for them. And that we will send them out to a sleep specialist. But it's a really important piece. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of men. Again, sleep can be related to what's going on with them psychologically. So we have a lot of men where we diagnose that at night, if you're one of those anxious people, that's when your anxiety comes out. You get anxious, you're ruminating, you're going over the same things you know, um, throughout the day. And so we will put them on antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, which will sometimes help with the way they're approaching their erections and their social anxiety. Um, and then a lot of them will say that they're sleeping dramatically better as well. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot to this. So now tell me, do you work with uh, gay men too? Gay and straight oh, men? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, we have, I would say we have, you know, we have an office in Manhattan and I have really tried to make it clear that we are gay friendly. Um, you know, if you think it's hard to go to a doctor with erection issues, now imagine you're a gay man going to a straight doctor, you know, and talking about, erection issues. And unless you know in advance that this is someone who's going to be comfortable with this, it's really can be very intimidating. And I did start this 25 years ago. And of course, thank God we've come so far, you know, in gay rights and gay liberation and, and people being comfortable with themselves and other people being comfortable with them that it's just, it's a different era. Uh, but right. I've always, of course, been comfortable with this since every other person in my family is gay. And it's so obvious that we this is just who and, people are, you know. Oh, and so you have a son that's gay. So I do. So yeah. so it's a and he's an at, uh, so it's it's interesting that all of this kind of all the pieces kind of play out together. Yeah, it's not uh, actually. I would have to give my wife more credit for his activism. She's she was one of those activists from way back. Soviet. She worked for Soviet Jewry for a long time, and there was not a rally uh, happening anywhere that she did not take the kids to. You know, and so um, he created, uh, I'm very proud of him, his name is Adam Eli, and he created an organization called Voices For that advocates uh, for queers in trouble anywhere in the world. Um, this is sort of a non sequitur, but, you know, there's a Jewish principle, and, you know, I'm clearly Jewish, that, you know, that Jews have to take care of each other. And he said, well, you know, queers are not doing that. And so he sort of brought that Jewish uh, consciousness into gay activism and i think he has like almost seventy thousand followers and he he speaks internationally and he has a book coming out uh and it's uh it's pretty cool actually well maybe he would like to so, come on our show um i'm sure he would, no, yeah, he's, would love, uh, yeah that'd be kind of fun he's charming have. and uh i'm biased but he's really one of the most special people i've ever met well so. that would be wonderful i'd love to have him on if he's if he's interested yeah. just let us know yeah that'd I be will great indeed. thank you yeah, yeah. um and what, so what is, what's your, what are the stories? I don't know how to even put that, but a gay man coming in, are, are they having similar stories as a straight man? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's often very generational, you know, so um, we get the older gay men, many of whom were married to a woman, um, uh, and realized throughout that, you know, they were gay, but this is sort of what was expected of them, which of course means that they're much less interested in having sex with their partner, since that's not the partner that really uh, they're attracted to. Um, and often that, so they've had sort of a longstanding sort of suboptimal sex life, though not always, it's really fascinating. Um, and, um, and now they're sort of new at this. And yeah. by the time 
they're exploring this. They could be in their 40s or in their 50s, and their erections aren't as good, and they're already anxious to start with. Um, and if they're if they're going to be a top uh, with anal intercourse, then then of course I think they have to be even more rigid to to penetrate through an anus than uh, a heterosexual man has to do getting into a vagina. So it's uh, a lot of pressure on them um, right. as well as a learning curve. So yeah. um, so we get those, and then we get our. Um, it's still difficult to be gay. It's still not the same, you know, and there's still, um, at least like my son's generation, so he's just uh, turned 29, they're still five years behind uh, their peers in terms of their romantic lives because they didn't play around that much in high school, most of them, and they didn't have crushes. And uh, and so we find that, you know, their their experience levels are, are um, you know, can be less than than the average heterosexual man. And also, you know, there is a lot of uh, body issues. Um, I was going to ask general. you about that. I, 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 yeah. Was, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm glad you're bringing it up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, men and women both. I mean, men are very visual. And so, uh, which is, I think, one of the reasons why particularly women have so many issues with body dysmorphia and anorexia and bulimia. But um, if you're a gay man, so then you know that there's a, you're very visual and you know that that uh, the person you're sexually attracted to and, and uh, hoping to have sex with uh, is also very visual. So, you know, if you're not uh, right now, it's very, you know, fat is not an acceptable, you know, any fat is not, you know, the way to look. And so there's a lot of body dysmorphia and people feeling badly about themselves and almost unentitled, you know, to have sex if, if they're not skinny, 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 or muscular, muscular, muscular. And so we have to sort of break through that a lot. Um, so we do find um, that a lot of these issues uh, are magnified, you know, in, in the gay men. But I don't know, to me, they're, they're the, one of the groups that I most love seeing and, um, and, the, and the easiest uh, in some ways to make a difference for. Hmm. And why the easiest? Oh, I'm sorry. So they're the, they, they have, they need a lot of work, you know, and a lot of, uh, um, they need a lot of compassion and they need a lot of uh, us feeling comfortable with them, which they never know is going to be a guarantee when they walk in. They need to be sent to the right therapists who are going to understand them. Um, so uh, we need to sort of troubleshoot all of the issues, you know, mm -hmm. look, and some of them have really been rejected by their families right. and are out there on their own. Some of them, you know, are then turning to substance abuse because um, they've just had such a hard road. So, you know, my heart really you know, just based on my own experiences and my family and just because if you're a nice person, you know, like they, they've just had a harder time. And so they deserve our help and they're really a pleasure as a group. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Yep. I agree. Uh, yeah, go ahead. One of, the, one of the things, yeah, one of the things we haven't really talked about um, is men with uh, Peyronie's disease, which is a very common thing that we see. So what Peyronie's disease is, um, is when men develop a bend or twist or curve to the penis. Um, there's been commercials on TV now. So it's like a scar tissue of the actual uh, lining of the, the chambers of the penis. And, and it can happen suddenly or it can happen after they've had some kind of trauma with intercourse. Um, and so that they can get this curvature of the penis, which can be so extreme, it can be like 90 degrees to the point where they actually can't penetrate, you know, a partner. Um, and the nice thing about that is that in the last uh, five years or so, there is a new medication um, called Zyaflex um, that we can actually inject directly into the scar tissue um, and which has a pretty good success rate of dissolving it so that we can help straighten out the penis. Okay. Um, it's when I promised any man who walks in, I said, you know, if you have a, if you have a penis, we can get you an erection. We're always going to get them erections. With the Peyronie's disease, the Zyaflex does not always work. Unfortunately, I like everything that's sort of a guarantee. But if we do it and it doesn't work, then I will send them to a real uh, mm -hmm. reconstructive specialist and they can get it, uh, you know, fixed Thanks. surgically. But most people always prefer to, um, you know, have it uh, a non-surgical intervention sure. rather than a surgical one. So, I would say with that, it's, it does take a lot of finesse to get the to get the medicine in the right place. So if a man has that problem, I'm obviously not the only one in the country doing that, but they should really, really pick a urologist who has a lot of experience in this particular area because uh, you'll do, just do much better. You know, so I, I want to just remind everyone, if you're just tuning in or whatever, you know, the 
great thing about Mays, one of the great things that I'm learning is that, you know, a man and a woman or a man and a man can, can be, or a woman and a woman can, can go together. I mean, cause in, in very often it could be a couple thing, right? Maybe not just the male thing or the woman, but both of you need to yeah. be working so, with the same time. And here's your, here's an option. Right. right. So it's really the, again, the fun ones, and this really is fun. So I keep saying that, but the, the fun ones are when the couple comes in and they're both, <laughs> I mean, it sounds terrible, but they're both having sexual dysfunction. Why is that fun? Is Well, we have the women's center and we have the men's center. So um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So we had one couple uh, where he had erection issues and that was what they'd recognized. But then once he, once we managed the erection issues, we realized that she had what we call vaginismus. So he was getting this erection, but every time he tried to penetrate, it was like hitting a brick wall. And so we then treated her for vaginismus. So, you know, you need an erection, you need a vagina that can actually at least, you know, hold a penis or get a penis inside. And right. so we treated them for both. And, and they were actually, they had come in because they were actually more interested in having children than they were in sex. But obviously we, we got them within a very short period of time, able to have sex. And I think they had a baby, you know, within a year of starting to see us. And so wow. that was very gratifying, but you're hitting both sides. The other ones I really like are the, the women are having orgasmic problems who are married to men who have either erection issues or premature ejaculation. Well, that's not a match, you know? And so, and they sort of look at this problem. It's like, oh my God, where do we even start? You know, and so we'll often refer one clinic to the other. We're all, you know, under the same roof. And so, you know, you're working on her having libido and being able to reach an orgasm and you're working on him being able to get an erection or not having the premature ejaculation. So the synergy, you know, it does take two to tango, you know, it that's really our goal. Does. And so- yeah, and so it could be a lot of, of things, right? It could be, there can be so many issues that can cause right. these so issues. Right, so on the men's side, right. So on the men's side, they could be having erection issues. They can have premature ejaculation. They can have Peyronie's disease. They can have a low libido they, from a low testosterone. They can have depression. That, you know, So they can have all of these things. And the women are even more complicated than the men. Mm -hmm. And they can have low libido. They can have arousal problems. They can have pain with intercourse. They can have orgasmic issues. You know, and so... Um, you know, if we're not handling all of those, then they're really going to have a suboptimal sex life. And how many people actually work in your centers? Oh, it's a lot. It's um, a lot. So, um, yeah. So each, well, besides, so we have the the men's team, um, and that's that's headed by me. And we have uh, then two nurse practitioners. We have a sex therapist. We have. Uh, two medical assistants, and we have a nutritionist. Um, so that's all, and an exercise physiologist. Um, so that's sort of on my side. Uh, and then we have the women's center, and each uh, woman is seen by a therapist um, as well as uh, a nurse practitioner or a PA. So we have three teams of those. And then we, because I do infertility, we do have a lab that does a lot of semen analyses, and we have one of the big local sperm banks. So when I say we have a sperm bank, it's for men to use for their themselves. It's not like a donor sperm bank. It's right. um, again, we're, we're near Sloan Kettering. We're near. So if a man um, is going to be undergoing like a procedure where he's going to uh, have his production or delivery of the sperm threatened, then we'll bank the sperm, you know, in advance. Um, right. That can be testosterone. That can be chemotherapy. That can be surgery. Um, and then we also have the cord blood uh, bank. Um, so we have a bunch of different pieces. They're all sort of very interrelated, obviously. I wonder, do you have any questions on them as a, as a man listening to this? No, I'm just curious. All right. Anybody out there, if you have any questions at all, 919-518-9773, this is your chance. Computers 2K voice on Skype, and you still have time to enter into our chat and ask questions there. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. Comment, ask questions. If you've had any experience in this area, you do not have to give your name, but share your experience. We'd love to hear from you and, um, you know, learn from you. So how does menopause affect men? Menopause? Well, yeah, women's you know, menopause. Yeah, so, you know, I sort of, uh, again, this is a little bit controversial, but I'm not sure that women should have to go through menopause. It's like sort of like if I told the average man that you're going to lose all your testosterone or that your testes are going to shrivel up and disappear, they wouldn't be so accepting of this. Um, but assuming that a woman goes through menopause, often their testosterone levels are by definition dropping, and often they will have a lower libido, not everyone, obviously, and they will uh, 
and women needs estrogen in order to keep the vagina lubricated and moist. And so then they have what's called atrophic vaginitis, where basically um, it's uncomfortable and um, uh, painful when they're having intercourse. So we definitely want to manage the symptoms, you know, of women with menopause. So uh, we'll, we have a lot of women that we put on testosterone replacement therapy. It's very interesting. There's a laser. It's very counterintuitive that you can actually use in the vagina. Uh, the one we use is the brand is called the Mona Lisa. <laughs> and what it does is it sort of burns off, you know, the, the, the layer of uh, skin in the vagina, the epithelium, and when it re when it heals, it actually is plumper and more like what they had before they went uh, through menopause. But I sort of see women as going through menopause as the same thing as men. You know, menopause means sort of like going like this, and then it stops. So women are sort of falling off a cliff slowly, uh, whereas men are sort of going downhill slowly. You know, and so at a certain point, most men will reach the point where they're uh, testosterones are low enough that they're noticing that they're symptomatic with, mm -hmm. you know, decreased energy, libido, muscle mass, uh, erections, you know, and a lot of people will say, well, you know, it's a natural, uh, function of age, which is true. As we get older, our testosterones get lower, but that doesn't mean we, I find that a foolish argument just because it happens with age doesn't mean we have to live with it. Um, Cholesterol levels go up as we get older. High blood pressure goes up. We don't just say, oh, you have a high cholesterol level. And, you know, a lot of old people get heart attacks and strokes. Um, so that's just what it is. We try to manage it. And so as men get older, if their uh, testosterones are getting lower, which they are, but if they become symptomatic, we don't have to assume that it's just from getting older. We should manage it and manage it aggressively. Um, it's really dramatic when you see the, you know, the men in their seventies who are being treated with testosterone and the average one who is not, you know, um, it's really, it's hard I, I to think, conceive. Right. And I think just even having this conversation. I'm sure that there's so much more to talk about. And if I, I was a doctor, we'd be having it on a different level. But I'm, the point is just hearing this conversation for men that are out there, uh, women that are out there listening that can, you know, guide the men in your life to something like, you know, listening to the show and whatever. I think that opens up a whole new world. So many people yeah, hide from things. Yeah. We you know. do find that a lot of the time it's the women who do the research and finally, you know, uh, tell their partners, husbands, whatever, that, that they have to come in. Um, right. And it's amazing how long some of the men will resist. And I always find it it's sort of amusing. But if the man's put it off for too long and then comes in, first of all, I tell them, you know, I look them in the eye and say, like, I'm going to get you erections, you know, then often they'll start crying, which is sort of charming. And, um, and then uh, they don't really believe me until I've done it. Um, and, you know, I've done this enough times that I sort of know the difference. But I warned them in advance, you know, if they've waited a long time, it's like, your wife is going to want to kill you. You know, she's going to love the fact that now you've been managed, but she is going to be so angry that you took so long. And you just have to suck it up because she's right and you're wrong. Um, right. And uh, you should have come in a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, you'll reach an equilibrium. So, um, I you know, mean, one of the things we... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. Well, I, I wanted to talk uh, about uh, the different treatments for erection issues, because I think that uh, a lot of men, in fact, most men and most women don't really know what's out there. So be, when I opened my practice, which was 1995, that was before Viagra, which came out actually on my anniversary in 1998, um, and before the internet. So the men really thought that they were alone. If they had erection issues, they thought they were the only people in the world. Um, and they thought they were just so bizarre and cursed and something was fundamentally wrong with them. With Viagra, that opened the door. And then Bob Dole, of course, um, started uh, talking about it. And really men sort of realized not only was this common, but there was something they could do about it. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that many men don't respond to that group of medicines, which are called the PDE5 inhibitors. Um, they are in order Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, and Stendra. Um, and first of all, many men take them incorrectly, which we'll talk about in a second. But uh, even then, many men, even if they take it correctly at the maximum dose, are not going to get and maintain good erections. And then, of course, they feel like they're doubly screwed over. Like they went, everyone else is responding. No one else has the problem. They go, now they're taking the pills and it's not working. And so, but again, we can get, you know, anyone 
uh, good erections. Um, the most, for the, if the pills are not working, even when they're taken correctly, then my favorite technique to use are what are called the penile injections. So I can sort of feel Amnon putting his, uh, his uh, hands over his crotch as we speak. Um, and basically, it, they sound terrible and they're amazing. So what happens is, in jet, what the man is doing is he takes a device, it's called an auto injector, puts a 30 gauge needle, teeny, teeny, teeny needle uh, into the auto injector, presses the button, and it, it gives an injection um, into the side of the penis, into the erection chambers. It does not hurt, which no one believes me. It feels like you've been flipped with a rubber band. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is injecting medication directly where the man needs it to cause an erection. Um, and that works in almost all men. Um, uh, certainly 85% of the men who come in where the pills are not working. And those men can get absolutely extraordinary uh, erections. Um, uh, in fact, actually, most of the men who are doing porn are using these injections. Um, and that's why if, if you ever see porn, a lot of these men go, I mean, literally, if you were to count the thrusts, it's like in the thousands, which is physiologically impossible before keeping the erection and ejaculating. Um, and then they keep the erection even after the ejaculating because they've used uh, the injections. Um, so I think it's really important for the men to know that if they have failed with the pills, first of all, uh, go back and make sure you're taking it correctly. And second of all, think about the other options. And there's, of course, injections, there's a vacuum pump. And uh, for some men, because, again, you have to get the blood into your penis and you have to hold on to it, if they have a trapping mechanism, if they have a hard time holding on to the blood, sometimes nothing but a penile prosthesis is going to work. And that's an implant. And the men love, love, love them. So I don't happen to do them anymore because most of my men don't need them. And I'm an obsessive perfectionist, so I sent them out. Um, but the men do love them. And if you go to someone who doesn't um, who sort of decides whether you need one and then go to the place where they do them really well, it's a really great intervention, which is the main reason why we can say that we can get an erection for anyone. Hmm. And masturbation. What do you tell men about masturbation? Or what do you tell women so, about masturbation? Yeah, so well, let's talk about the men for a minute. So okay. first of all, um, it's completely a normal thing to do. Um, and it's really important that 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 men learn how to masturbate at an early age. Um, you and um, so that's one. Uh, because if they don't, then it, it's actually can be hard to learn how to ejaculate later. So it's really really important. What we do find interestingly is that we have a group of men, and it's this is not uncommon, who walk in and say, you know, my libido is low. I just don't want to have sex with my wife that much. And so when my next question is, well, how often? Are you masturbating? Um, and they'll say, you know, I don't have a low, I have a low libido, but I'm masturbating, you know, once a day or twice a day. It's like, well, how often do you have sex with your wife? Every two weeks, you know. Well, it's like clearly that ratio is not a good one. Um, so, and the reason why people do that is, first of all, um, it's you know, it's it's a it's a guaranteed orgasm. You know, it's really easy. It's no mess, no fuss when you masturbate. Um, a lot of men are masturbating to porn, and, and often the porn now is becoming, that's a whole nother discussion, but the porn is becoming something different than what they're actually engaging in. So it's very extreme. You know, a lot of people can have things that they would never be doing. And so actual real sex can't compare to the porn. <laughs> so I sort of invoke what I call the, it's the only time I've ever named after something after myself. I call it the Werner rule, which is that if you're masturbating a lot, but not having enough sex with your partner, then what you do is, you are, you have, after you have sex, you are allowed to masturbate as much as you want to your heart's content for a day or two afterwards. So, so that sort of gives you a double incentive. Okay, hold on. Can I, I partner. have to interrupt you a second. So yeah, give me sure. a ratio. How many times a week should somebody, is a good number for sex and how many times a week for masturbation? So the sex is the issue and the, the masturbation is the fill-in. So if your man has a really high libido, if he's having enough sex with his partner and she or he is satisfied, he can masturbate as much as he wants. There's no, there's no uh, limit. Uh, you know, sometimes I think it takes an obsessive quality and then we have to wonder why is someone spending so much time uh, masturbating? You know, if you're getting up to three and four times a day, you know, why is that happening? Is, are, are you anxious? Are you obsessed? But, you know, I have men who have great uh, sex lives with their partners and are masturbating even on the same day that they're having sex, you know, and that's fine. There's really no downside. To me, the, the key is you don't want to masturbate so much that you're not having enough sex with your partner because it just decreases your interest. So it really is age dependent and couple dependent. So it's not really 
an absolute number. Um, I, you know, most people think other people are having a lot more sex than they are. Um, I sort of say as a target, you know, if you aim, again, it depends on the couple, so I can't do this generally, but if you aim for twice a week, you know, um, and then you end up getting three to five times a month, that is an adequate sex life. That should be sort of your floor for really keeping sort of like a dynamic tension. between. And that's for any people. age. Well, I would say that that's the goal. And, but we have tons of people, men, you know, and women who come in and they're in their 70s and 80s. And um, they like, we're once a month and we're really good with that. And, and you can see both of them are really happy. They have that sort of spark between them. And that's great. So I, I don't really think we can, um, okay. you know, come up with a number. But I do feel like if they're young and they're having sex once every two, two months, you know, I know it's a problem. So it's like pornography. I know what it's a problem. I can't tell I you exactly you. what it I is. I got you. And, and if you don't use it, you don't lose it? Yeah, I think when, uh, when, when people are not, when men are not have, masturbating or having sex, um, then it's not good for their penis physiologically. It's not good for their prostate. Um, so it's really important that they both uh, stimulate and, and have good erections. Um, if we have a minute, I did want to just talk about, because I think this would be interesting for general, for men. I want them to understand the difference between the PDE5 inhibitors, the Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, Dendris, and a little bit about how they work. First of all, the Viagra is sildenafil and Cialis is Tadalafil. Both of those are generic and they are unbelievably cheap right now. So if you go onto a website called GoodRx, which I have no affiliation with, you can get a coupon that gives you about 90 of the 20 milligram Cialis uh, for about 70 cents each, you know, and then you can get uh, from Walmart or from Stop and Shop. Um, so you don't need to go to these blue pill online or, you know, all these places that are popping up that are doing no evaluation. If you go to your doctor and you get a prescription, either it'll go through your plan or you can get it, um, the, the real generics, unbelievably cheaply. Mm -hmm. But when you use them, it's really important that you use them correctly. So for example, Viagra has to be taken on an empty stomach. If you take it with a full meal, it's just not going to work. And you always want to start with the maximum dose, which, for example, with Viagra, which is sildenafil, is 100 milligrams, and it peaks about an hour after you take it. So if you're going to use Viagra, sildenafil, you want to take 100 milligrams at least to start with an hour before you're going to have sex on an empty stomach. Now, Cialis, which is Tadalafil, um, uh, you can take with food. Um, and, but it doesn't kick in until two to four hours after you take it. So if you take it and then try to have sex 15 minutes later, you're not going to get a good erection. Um, and then, of course, a lot of people call that the weekend drug because it's broken down so slowly. But at 18 hours, you'll only have half of what's in your system at two to four hours. And so it may not be active. And of course, at 36 hours, it's almost all gone. So it's really, that's a, it's important that you understand how fast it goes into your system and how fast it's broken down and whether you need to take it with food. And the most interesting newest one on the block is what's called um, uh, Stendra, which is still branded. Um, and the cool thing about that is that it kicks in within about 15 to 30 minutes. So if you want to be a little bit more spontaneous, even though it's not as strong as the other ones, that one sort of, if you're sort of caught off guard or she initiates something or he initiates something, you can sort of uh, use that and that'll kick in quite quickly. It so it's like, important. Yeah, and it sounds yeah, like that, the one that activates quicker, it sounds like there's something else going on there, that there is some kind of connection that is that the spontaneous, spontaneity, that it's there, it, it, that, you know, the one that's, you know, an hour later or several hours later is, is, is more... Um, there's, there's a difference. Yeah, yeah. and the, the, there's a difference in sex when it's spontaneous, when you know that it's going to be spontaneous or when yeah. something's already happening. That, right. We the really stress to people, though, that planned sex is better than no, no sex. No sex, right. I and got it's you. it's only a little You're bit right. worse right. and right. not than spontaneous right. sex. So, if, you yeah. know, look, once you have... Yeah there's a magic period where you don't have any children and you're not using contraception that everything is spontaneous, like all nine times, you know, uh, depending on how fertile you are. But, you know, once you get older, then you have the kids, then you have the, you know, the, so it's like, and then when you're younger, then you're sneaking around making sure your parents, and then when you're older, you're having erection. It's like, so most of your life, <laughs> right. if you want to have a good life, 
sex life, you're going to have to plan it. Get over that hurdle, you know, yeah. um, is my personal feeling. So now I want, please tell everyone where they can find you, how they find you and all of that stuff. Plug yourself now. You're got it. So, um, so my name is you have on the, is on the bottom. Our website is, uh, we have several, but it's maze men's health. Um, and our offices are in Westchester County, which is north of the city. And we have uh, an office literally right next to Grand Central. So a lot of people take Amtrak uh, in and then literally walk three or four blocks to our office. Uh, we do have a cord blood bank called Maze Cord Blood. Um, and that number is 914-683-0000. I was very proud of getting that number. Uh, the advantage uh, is that it's just much more reasonable than the big banks um, and also the highest quality because it's one of the public banks um, that does it, the processing for us. Uh, and we have the Women's Center and we have a sperm bank. And I do think we, we put things together in a very comprehensive and uh, compassionate way. So well, and and I, I love doing this. And I, can t and I can tell and I'm sure we all can tell and I feel like today we did the world some justice. So hold on for a second. I'm not, you have my... Um... So here are my books. I'm going to put up a new one soon because I'm finished with the opioid book. So I have in just one afternoon listening to the hearts of men, in just one afternoon listening to the hearts of twins and millennials. Then the opioid one will be being published very soon. And then soon thereafter will be Black Fathers. Uh, and they're all on Amazon and they're both ebook and print. And they all in, are all interviews, intimate interviews with the subjects of the book and share everything imaginable. So Michael, it was just so lovely to have you here and I would love to have you come back again. Thank you, anytime, it was really a pleasure. Yeah, because I'd okay. like to Happy have some Happy New more, Year to everyone. You, you too, I'd love to have some more conversations with you and, and maybe in the future, if, if it's possible, I don't know, maybe somebody's willing to come on and talk about some personal experiences. If that's a possibility. We do actually have a few patients like that uh, who really want everyone to know that there's help out there. So can we build a show around that too? Yeah, let's, let's give it a try. I would sure. love to. So I'm going to, we'll connect with you again because I think that would be really special. Perfect. So let's do I that. I look forward to it. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much for being Thanks here, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm Nan and everyone. We'll see you next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And thank you so much for being here once again. Bye. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.